Pam, it's your turn. Push record. Yeah, I, I've already done it and it stopped it. Go ahead and go ahead and it start. Okay, so I can start now. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Welcome to Celebrate the Arts, brought to you by the Florida Artist Group, also known as FLAG. FLAG is proudly celebrating our 72nd annual exhibition and symposium. My name is Pamela Miles, and it is my great pleasure to introduce session number 12. Um, this is how to hear yes to gallery representation with a panel discussion with Chang, um, Rolando Chang Barrero, Angie L. Berry, and Amanda Cooper um, with the moderator, Renee Lewis, artist. This presentation is being recorded for later publication and public access. So we request that you remain muted throughout your questions are encouraged, but we ask that you hold them until the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. As a courtesy, please keep your questions short and on topic. Now, please welcome Renee Lewis and the panelists. Good morning. Good morning, Pam. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to um, present this program and I um, am so appreciative and thankful for Amanda, Rolando, and Angie for um, being our esteemed panelists. Um, so we're going to begin first with Amanda Cooper. Um, Amanda will tell you more about herself, but by way of introduction, um, she is the curator of exhibitions at the Morian Art Center in St. Petersburg and has held that position since 1999. And she has organized over 400 exhibitions. So um, Amanda, um, I will give you the floor. Hi everyone, and thank you to FLAG for this opportunity and all the great work that you do on behalf of Florida artists. And um, we're here to talk about how to hear yes from a gallery. First, I'll tell you a little bit about the organization I work for. As Renee said, the Morian Art Center is located in beautiful downtown St. Petersburg. We are a 105 year old community arts institution. So we've been around a long time. And we have four locations. We have the Morian Art Center, which is located on Central Avenue, where we have five exhibition spaces and classrooms for adults and students, for adults and kids rather. And across the street from the Morian Art Center is the Chihuly Collection, which is one of the only permanent collections of Dale Chihuly's glass installations in the world. We also have a glass studio where you can see live glass blowing demonstrations so people can come and find out how glass is made. And last but not least, we have the Morian Center for Clay, which is in a historic train station and is the largest working pottery in the Southeast, third largest in the nation. So we're a pretty big organization with a small staff. Um, but I've been here for 23 years and um, I'd like to think that me being here for a long time has really helped me. I started right out of college. I was very green, didn't know what I was doing. So I feel like I'm sensitive to artists who are coming and um, they're emerging. They're not sure what to do. And I feel like my humble beginnings here have made me sensitive to that. Um, sometimes artists start out and they don't know how to approach a gallery. So um, that's what we're here for, to enlighten you a little bit. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about researching a gallery before you approach it to show your work. And my colleague Rolando is probably going to go into more depth with that, but I wanted to just touch on it a little bit. Um, it seems obvious, but there's a lot of artists that don't do their research before they approach a gallery. Um, for instance, if a gallery is showing mostly uh, abstract work, you probably don't want to take your photorealistic paintings to them. You're probably going to hear no, not because you're not a good artist, but because that's not the purpose of the gallery. So it's super easy nowadays to just get online, look at an institution's website, whether it's a gallery or a museum, see what kind of work they're showing. Every museum, every gallery has kind of a look. 
um, see where your work fits in there and if it fits in there and if it doesn't just move on. There's plenty of other institutions that would probably be a better fit for your work. Um, look at their website, look at their Instagram, social media feeds, see what kind of tone they have. Um, and for every different institution, they have different ways of how they want an artist to approach them for an exhibition. And usually that information is on their website. So check out their website. Um, for instance, at the Morian, we have a button on our website that says artist opportunities and you click on it and it tells you some upcoming shows that we have that might be open to any artists or it gives you the instructions on how to apply for a general gallery exhibition. Um, for us, it's an online form. You upload your images and it sends me an email and I see them that way. Um, so that's how usually I'm introduced to an artist. Uh, it goes without saying, but you should never just approach a gallery, just come on in unannounced with your portfolio. That's a big no-no. And I know we've all seen that over, over the years, but um, that's, that's not, it's not a good way to do it. You should always follow the gallery's instructions as best you can. Um, and also, some of the things that can get you a yes from a gallery, the most important thing is your images. Um, as we all know, images, that's how people see your work, especially now in our digital society. Um, it used to be in the old days, when I first started working here, you would go more out and about to different festivals and galleries and see artists work in person. But now the first time you see an artist's work, it's online. So make sure your website is up to date and has lots of current information. I would encourage all artists to be on social media, especially Instagram. I love looking at an artist's website. It gives you um, a sense of the artist's latest work and that sort of thing. But Instagram to me gives you a, um, an immediate feel for the artist and their personality. Um, um, you can see the work that they're they're doing right now and you get a you get a real sense of the artist and part of my curatorial practice I guess you could say is because I've been doing this for so long I've had the privilege of knowing artists for a long time for decades and being able to see the trajectory of their work over the years and I really get to know them and um, have a relationship with them so that's kind of important to me is getting a sense of what the artist is like as a person not just their work so um, anything you can do to have that personality shine through for me personally I really I really like that um, stick to one theme there's a lot of artists that do lots of different things but when you're approaching a gallery make sure your portfolio is focused on on one specific theme because a curator is always looking at your work and picturing how it's gonna look in a gallery. And if you submit 10 different images and 10 different styles, it wouldn't make a cohesive show. So um, just even if you can do a bunch of different things, stick to one when you're approaching a gallery. Um, but again, it's important that your images look great. If you're not a great photographer, take classes, learn how to photograph your work um, or hire someone. There's plenty of professional photographers around. Um, here at the Morian, we have a terrific uh, staff photographer. Her name is Beth Reynolds. And we actually have a program where you can, for a fee, you can hire her to, um, she'll come out to your studio. If you're in the Hillsboro, Pinellas area, she'll come out to your studio and teach you how to set up an inexpensive um, photography studio to shoot your own work at home doesn't, you don't need a lot of expensive equipment nowadays. Cell phones are great. You can use those to shoot your work. Um, so images are very important. If your images are not good, then that's um, kind of an automatic no a lot of times right off the bat. Um, your artist statement and your bio should be really simple. Um, you don't have to have a lot of academic speak in there. Remember, it's just explaining to people what your process is, what your philosophy is about your work. Um, you want to make it easy to understand. Um, and if you don't have a lot of exhibitions under your belt or a big, um, you know, MFA or whatever, sometimes a 
brief biography written in a paragraph form is a better way to um, convey who you are instead of a listed CV. Um, but all in all, I want to um, say, don't be discouraged. You're going to hear no a lot of times. Everybody does, every artist does, um, but don't be discouraged. Keep out there. I just had a, um, I just had an artist friend who is really now trying to get into gallery shows and she's developed a body of work. She's done everything right. She's developed a body of work and she has just sent out um, uh, proposals to 80 institutions. And a week later, she was very discouraged because she'd only heard back from two of them. And I thought, well, that's probably a pretty good number, two of them who were, who were positive. And um, she says, oh, I've gotten two that said, or one that said, um, I'll keep your info on file, which she said, I think that was a nice way to say, you know, take a hike. And I said, whoa, 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 not necessarily. Because I might tell an artist, um, I'll keep your information on file. And it might mean I would never show your work here at the Morian. But a lot of times it means I have very limited gallery space. And for every for every exhibition slot that I have, there are a hundred amazing artists and amazing exhibition ideas, but you just never know. I have a file of artists work um, that I keep. And over the years, I might look back at it and suddenly I have an idea for a show and I think, oh yeah, that artist sent in a portfolio to me five years ago and it would fit perfectly with this. So um, that's happened more times than I can count over my career here at the Morian. So don't be discouraged. Um, maybe doesn't mean no, you just never know. Sometimes these things take time. So, so keep at it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about, that's about all I have. You too. Great, thank you, Amanda. And um, hopefully we'll have so I, I put in a question, but hopefully we'll have some others for you. So thank you so much. So I would like to introduce our second presenter, Rolando Chang Barrero. And Rolando is the curator. He's um, for the Box Gallery in West Palm Beach. And um, Rolando, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, the floor is now yours. Well, thank you, Renee, and welcome everybody to the workshop and uh, the presentation. Uh, it, it's always an honor to, to work with artists, to speak with artists. Uh, uh, I am an artist myself. Uh, I graduated in 1991 from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, after 15 years of working independently, as a graphic designer, painter, fashion designer, model, and, and photography stylist. I decided that I needed a formal education. Um, so I understand when people come to me and they say, well, I've been working and I don't need to uh, go to school formally. I understand that 100%, uh, but what I did have was a lot of hands-on experience working with fine artists, some of the best printmakers, um, and working hand in hand as their intern in lieu of an education, which I eventually went back to get a solid foundation um, because I realized that I knew very little about art history. Um, and I didn't know anything about the context of my work. And I was doing a lot of repetitive stuff. And someone said, it's very beautiful, but it's derivative. And I was like, what does that mean? Uh, and they were like, well, if you're from Texas, it means, um, aren't you sweet? And I was like, ouch. <laughs> um, and it's not that they meant to insult me, but they meant to tell me that, that although the work was good, um, it wasn't fresh, it wasn't tackling new issues, it wasn't, it was aesthetically beautiful. Um, and that that was not what they were looking for. The, I, um, 
I then learned that different institutions, different galleries, different co-ops uh, function and have different uh, purposes. Uh, they all want to sell work except for uh, maybe museums, which they do acquire and, and sell at some, at some point. But their main um, purpose is exhibitions uh, and putting content and context in order for people. I, um, I spent my early years working in the nonprofit world and we worked in social justice work because we were in Chicago and it was a heated time. They were burning flags. Uh, they were doing a whole bunch of live performances. Uh, video and film was coming out. Um, and that was another aspect of the art world. Um, personally, I collect landscapes, nice oil landscapes. Uh, but I also have a six foot plushy pink rat that's bigger than I am in my collection. Uh, so that with all of that said is I had to learn when I presented my work to a gallery, um, what is it that I want? Um, and I had to get an understanding that it is a business, a museum, a nonprofit or a private gallery is a business. Um, and all those walls are seen as real estate. How much can I give a person in exchange for either an in-kind service because I believe in the work, because I can sell the work? And those are important considerations uh, as well as the quality of the work. And this, um, it goes beyond saying that most of the work that I'm approached with is of excellent quality and it's very well developed. Um, and at some point, um, people do have degrees or have been educated enough to warrant exhibiting the work, yet it may not fit for my gallery. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go on to the screen sharing a little bit. Um, so you get an idea. I run the Box Gallery in West Palm Beach and my gallery tends to be um, a hybrid. I'm a geek. Uh, I sit around and read thesis work uh, from a, a website called academia.com, uh, which is where most graduate students upload their thesis. Um, and I study science, art, uh, and I look to put work into a social justice um, content, context. So I know everybody wants to hear a yes. <laughs> Has everybody seen my, the presentation? Is it up? Okay, so with that said, I always wanna hear a yes. And sometimes I even get a no. Um, after uh, months of researching the museum or the gallery and uh, even speaking to the curator, um, the nuance of the work is not a fit for the show. Um, and no, it's never nice to hear, but you know, it happens and it is part of, okay. So everybody likes to hear, yeah. Uh, everybody likes to hear yes, but not everybody can. Um, this current show is what's coming up for me, and it's the work of Tal Danino, and he's a biologist. And he works with CRISPR, for example. And he does, uh, he's also a visual artist. And these are bacteria, and they, they're huge petri dishes, about six foot, but they create a beautiful image, uh, aesthetically pleasing, and it enters into a conversation about the development of CRISPR, which is a science, uh, the development of germline editing, uh, the superior race, CRISPR, eugenics. Um, so that's why I've chosen this particular artist. Um, and I'm saying this so that you get a, con a context of how my gallery works. Some work belongs indoors, some work belongs outdoors. This is an outdoor mural project that I, that I coordinate. 
Um, so this, this person happens to use a different medium than I do. When I do murals, I paint, he uses spray cans, um, but he still uses classical images. And that's what fascinated me about him. Uh, moving forward, uh, it's up to you uh, to work at getting the yes. Knowing how to present your work and knowing how to speak about your work and having points of references uh, that are easily identifiable by the person who you're doing your presentation to. It is easier than you think uh, to get a show, to present your work and to get representation only if you really want it. Um, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of give and take, a lot of negotiations. It is a contract with a business. When it's done, you have to have some kind of business savvy because there's going to be a lot of things that are going on. Um, and I grew up 15 minutes early is on time. On time is late and late is unacceptable. So if you set up an appointment with me at seven o'clock and you're not directly across from me uh, sitting down at seven o'clock, I'm on to my next thing. Uh, I'm a one person show and I'm scheduled very tight. As most people with most institutions, there's a lot of work that goes on. So if you want a yes, show up when you say you're going to show up. And I'm going to then go off to uh, the same thing that Amanda Cooper just mentioned a little while ago. Before you contact the gallery, do a little homework. Look at who, you're, who the person is showing. Look at what type of work the person is showing. You may even want to go as far as contacting other artists that have shown at the gallery and asking them what is the best way to approach the person. Um, Amanda likes looking at social media. I'm a little older than that, <laughs> probably by 30 years, her, her senior. Uh, <laughs> And I don't like um, looking at social media because I don't trust that people have not used filters and things like that. My eyes, I have to wear these and looking at things on my phone are, are real difficult for me. So if you approach me with a phone and, and stuff like that, I'm going to tell you, oh, darling, set up an appointment. I'll give you my card and... You know, and I don't mean anything not to give you not the time of day, but I'm an older human being and my eyes don't allow me to look at an iPhone, no matter how big it is. Um, and by all means, do not ever approach me during an opening. When I'm at an opening and I'm there um, talking to collectors and buyers and representing another couple of artists that are in the show, that is not the appropriate time to talk to me because then you will definitely get a no. Uh, so just say hi, introduce yourself nicely and give me your card and say, I would like to set up an appointment with you. And I'll, I will go out of my way to make time to speak with you. I'm in the business of art and you're the creator of art. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, and without you, I, I'm out of business. So it behooves me to want to meet with you and to look at your work and review it. Uh, but I just don't like looking at social media. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, let's get to the next uh, slide. Um, okay. Will your work fit in with the market in the direction of the gallery you're contacting? If I'm doing a uh, flora and fauna show, to talk about the, uh, the delicate aspect of Florida's ecosystem. I will have so many florals and um, so many animals and landscapes and, uh, in that show. Uh, if I am doing an exhibition of about the high, to enter into a conversation about high crime, um, I may have a different uh, presentation. So it's not to say that you're documenting um, war and coming back as a photojournalist won't get into my gallery. And if you paint nice oil paintings of landscapes, 
you won't get into my gallery, but it'll be in a particular context. And it's up to us to enter into a rapport whether a context that I'm looking for, that I've created, you want to allow your work to be seen in. Um, a lot of women, uh, particularly like uh, participating in women's exhibitions um, because of the low visibility that women have gotten. I refuse to, to pigeonhole women as, uh, as women artists um, because to me, that's a perception that they're different than um, and they need to be elevated uh, or somehow. I have great respect for women. I think they're artists, period. Uh, and I've had numerous exhibitions where I don't put the men's first names or the women's names on it uh, equally. Um, I think that work should stand on its own, not because of gender, sexuality, race, color, creed, unless the context of the exhibition is to expound on that issue. Does, is that clear? Um, does, if anybody has a question, please let me know. <laughs> um, to pay or not to pay? This is the one question that I always get asked. How much do you charge to be in your show? I'm an old world school gallery. I don't charge you. You don't pay. You can't pay your way into my gallery and rent one of my walls uh, and surprise me with woolly mittens and insist on having them shown because you're paying for a square footage of my gallery. Uh, I am not a co-op. I am not an arts and crafts shop. Um, because your work sells um, does not mean that I am going to necessarily show your work. Um, I curate exhibitions. I review work. I look at it for the quality of the work, the balance of the work, design elements, everything that would be considered. And yes, if you look at the corner of the screen, they're poking out. That is a 100% bronze two ton hydraulic penis on mag wheels. <laughs> and that pink uh, rat is in my private collection. Uh, so, and the back is uh, a sand piece by Janina Dwin that's on the floor of that image and the photographs of her work uh, at the top. And then we have an assortment of different types of paintings and um, things. So I am all over uh, the board as far as types of work that I will show. And this is where it gets sticky for a private gallery. I know that everybody likes to participate in every art call and tries to uh, get their work in. They like being in art fairs. Um, they go on every contest and they win every ribbon. Once the work has been seen that many times in so many different places, I don't have a purpose for it. I don't have any use for it uh, because it's not new, it's not fresh, it's not exclusive. And my, my clientele wants fresh, new, and exclusive. They want to be on the forefront of collecting emerging work. Um, so it's very difficult for me to even compete if you have a studio that is open to the public. Uh, you will be competing with me. Um, so the problem with people um, saying, we don't support local artists. Uh, we do support local artists. I represent local artists, but I'm not going to compete or have you compete with me within a, uh, the distance of a city. Either I represent you or you represent yourself. Um, and, you know, the social media fallback is that I show someone who's locally at my gallery, the buyers and the collectors will contact them in, on their own and they have access to them on their own. They will go visit them at their studios. And all I am doing is serving as a museum without grants. 
<laughs> so I, I'm just paying mortgage to advertise you at my space um, because the, you, that's why very few galleries, private galleries, uh, brick and mortar spaces still exist because social media has really cut out the curator um, and the art gallerist, you know. So uh, you have to be ready to let go of at least the presentation in, in your studios unless there's an appointment with a, a collector to visit your studio. Um, that's why uh, it's easier for me to represent someone who is from another county at least uh, within the state of Florida, but from another county or another state uh, because it's six of this and half a dozen of the other. You don't ever want to cramp or compromise a local artist either by tying them down with a contract. And how I said, it is a business. Um, and all these things need to be considered. So you could have fabulous work in a huge studio with a wonderful access and wonderful report to people. And I may say no. Okay, and these are questions that you need to have an answer to before you come see me. Where were you educated? How were you educated? What is your experience in the art? What is your knowledge base of the direction of your work? Uh, who influences your work? Um, you're, you're selling not your work to me. I could see your work but you're selling how much trust I could have in you, how much of a knowledge base you have for the development of your work in the future, because I am going to invest a lot of money in advertising in you. Um, so I wanted to know right off the bat, how much money and how much time have you invested in yourself? Uh, does it, is it equal? Um, if you have not invested any time, not taken any classes uh, and approach me and call yourself an abstract painter and cannot draw a figure, which you're not necessarily required to learn how to draw a figure, um, but you don't know the difference between objective and non-objective abstract work or anything about abstract work, I don't know if next week you're going to go off in another direction. I don't know if you'll be able to provide the work um, past the two pieces that you're showing me. Um, so I'm going to be a little hesitant to invest heavily in you. Uh, once again, do you have a body of work? Is it cohesive? Um, can I give you a solo show? Can you, can you hold your own in a solo show? Um, is it important to have a solo show? Um, yes. And it could also be the death of an artist. Um, because if the work doesn't look cohesive, doesn't look strong, you only have one opportunity to leave a lasting impression on major collectors. Uh, so be prepared, make sure it's framed, make sure it is presented the way it's going to look like in their collection. If you're showing photography, Museum quality non-glare glass is your responsibility, uh, not, not theirs because they're coming to see your photograph. They're looking at your photograph and there's a big glare on it. Um, they're gonna move along to the next piece. Uh, do you have a website? How much information to put on the website? How little information to put on your website? Who are you related to? Uh, in context to your associations, institutions. Uh, and once again, that comes to the, are you overexposed or underexposed? Um, I like people that are underexposed um, because I stand a better chance of elevating the artist. Uh, and your portfolio, what is the quality of your portfolio? What are you, what are you showing me? Uh, I have a series of work if I wanna show a whole series of work in the portfolio, and then I will give my, the rest of my work that may not go with that as my bio um, to show that I have 
50, 60 years in, uh, as a working artist, but my work has changed quite a bit. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, I just want to reassure everybody that my business is to sell art, to make you look your best, but it is a business and we need to sit down, we need to discuss how best you want to be represented and in which manner and where do you not want to be placed in what context you would not want to be seen. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to entertain answers, or you could always contact me through my website at theboxgallery.info. <laughs> Thank you, Rolando. That was a really wonderful information. And I, I neglected when I introduced you, I wanted to, um, say that Rolando recently received the Cultural Council of Palm Beach Muse Award for Outstanding Cultural Leadership. So um, you gave us a lot to think about and I, I think there probably will be some questions at the end, so thank you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce um, our third presenter, Angie Barry. And Angie has been the curator of exhibitions and collections at the Gadsden Art Center and Museum in Quincy, Florida, which is a little bit west of Tallahassee, um, since 2008. And she develops exhibitions on a local, regional, and national scope. So Angie, we're glad you're with us. Thank you. And um, I'll let you carry on. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me. This has been so interesting. And, you know, um, I agree with everything that Amanda and Rolando have already said, but I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what it's like my perspective. So I'm kind of similar to Amanda. I started out right out of grad school at my, my um, museum. And actually at the time we were an art center. So we were more gallery like in that we uh, showed a lot of local and regional artists, and we also sold the work. In 2016, we became accredited by the um, American Alliance of Museums, which means we're an art museum now, but we still represent a lot of our local artists, and we do that through several different avenues. Um, you know, the main gallery, the main mission of us, of our museum, is to educate, and so I can show artists without worrying about if I'm going to sell it or worrying about necessarily other things. However, I have a whole other host of issues. <laughs> For instance, I'm in a hundred year old building. We're in a very rural area that is under art educated. And so we really have a responsibility to introduce art to our audience, to our community and make sure that we're not alienating anybody. Um, and so we really are starting at, a, I think a different, um, starting point than say Amanda or Rolando where in their locations where there's so much art and so much competition where for us, you know, there's just not a lot of other, there's one other art museum um, in the, uh, in Tallahassee and it's connected with the, with the university. So um, we're very much a community arts museum, um, art center. Um, so also a little different for us is I have a committee, an exhibitions committee, and they are help me decide and what is gonna be in our different spaces. So I put on about 16 exhibitions a year in six different spaces. So I have several different galleries that I have to kind of contend with. Um, and so there's always lots of moving parts. What's great about that is that I can exhibit so many different artists at one time. I always have at least four to five different exhibitions going on at, at one time. So I don't have to necessarily rely on one artist to bring in our um, to bring in a, a our audience. I can have a smaller space where you can show 15, 20 pieces, and it it'll give you that solo exhibition. And at the same time, you'll be exhibiting alongside a major museum show that we borrowed from another museum in another part of the country, and it's actually really great exposure. We also have an artist guild, which this is the one caveat for having to pay to exhibit. I agree with Rolando, we don't have anything like that, but it is actually a level of membership. This is something that is at a lot of places um, where for us, it's um, our guild, they get to exhibit with me two times a year and they bring me two pieces 
and it's, you know, very laid back. I don't have any requirements for it other than it has to be ready to hang. And, you know, it's a great way for someone who's just starting out and has never exhibited their work before and they want to go, okay, I don't even know how to do this. And I can work with them and help you figure out how to present your work. Um, so that's if you're kind of at that end. And then at the other end of the spectrum is our, you know, major exhibitions um, where you can apply. And again, that goes, there's on our website, we have exhibition opportunities, go there, look at that first, you know, peruse the policies and procedures. One of the things that I have right now is I don't really have a budget for um, shipping and transporting uh, single artist work. So, you know, I'm expecting you to bring it to me and, you know, I'm, we have, we put a lot of time and resources into exhibiting your work and marketing it and, you know, ensuring it and taking care of it properly to museum standards, but I expect you to be able to get it to me. I expect good Im images because like everybody has said, if I don't, if I can't see good images, then how am I going to know that it's going to look good in my space? Another thing to think about when you're presenting images, also show some installation shots because it's really hard sometimes to see and understand the scale of something when you're just seeing an image. Like, it's great. I want those close-up images because I want to be able to zoom in and I want to be able to see the quality of the brush strokes or something like that. But I also want to see, well, how are you framing this? How do these look in conjunction together? How do they, they fit together? So again, you're always going to want to look and see what is the uh, gallery or museum require for images, but usually they're going to want you to send, you know, 10, 20 images, um, but also in addition to a website. But again, don't have a website if you're not going to keep it up to date, because the, the my least favorite thing is going to look up an artist and the images on this are not matching what the images online are not matching what you sent me or the bio is five years out of date. So it's almost better to not have anything than to have it not match what I'm expecting. Um, for us, we have, I work pretty far out. So I'm working two, three years in advance. And I understand as an artist, sometimes your work changes over that time, but then you have to work with me because what I've done is I've brought your work to a committee and they've approved this set, this specific exhibition. And if you bring me whole totally different work three years from now, that's not going to fly. I can't show something that hasn't been accepted. I can work with you or I can get it. If it's completely different, maybe go back to the committee. Um, but I, you, you got to make sure that whatever you're bringing to the table is what we agreed upon. Um, or, all, you know, and just keeping in contact with me, you know, like I said, I got a lot of spaces, so I may not always remember to get back in contact with you six months, three months at a time, but it's always good to just keep in touch and, um, you know, always be very responsive. I, I, I cannot stand when I send an email or I, or I call and I don't hear anything back. Well, that shows me that you aren't really that invested in this. And then does that mean you're going to show up with your work on time? Is it going to be properly presented? Are you going to have the correct paperwork that I need? Um, all of these things are, you know, important if you want to be serious about it um, and, you know, asking questions, things like that. What else was I going to say? I think, oh, one more thing just about, you know, I, I love to see a CV. I love to see where you've exhibited or where you're collected, if that's possible. But I also love to see an artist statement as well. And I don't typically always get this, but especially people who are right out of school, they tend to be a little academic. Um, that's great. Have your one that's academic and that is a lot of gobbledygook, but also write something that the lay person can read and understand. I mean, I love a gobbledygook, that's great. But remember as a museum, I'm trying to interpret this for my general audience who is under art educated. And if I can't make sense of what you're saying about your work, Ooh, that's hard. And I get you want the artwork to stand on its own and that's fine. Then say that, but it's, it's really hard. Um, it just makes it not as accessible and I'm trying to make art accessible for everyone. And, you know, again, I can have lots of different spaces and lots of different type of art, but it's gotta be something that I can bring to the table for them. Um, okay. I think that was everything <laughs> that, oh, I, and we are a collecting institution. And one thing I will tell you is having to, um, having to get your work in collections. Well, you can't make that happen. I mean, you can try to get the, your work in art museums, but most museums, it depends, but 
they don't have necessarily policies against it, but if you if you come to me and want to donate your work to our art collection, that's a hard thing to for me to do because it's self-serving for you. Um, because if your art is in my collection, that means it's elevated to the next level because it's now an art museum collection. So typically, unfortunately, it's either the museum's got to buy it from you, and that's something that happens. Um, you can always offer, but just know that sometimes that's not always going to be the case. Now, there are other museums who will work directly with, though there's an artist I do want, and it, maybe they'll work with you, but it's it's a dicey thing. Um, I tell a lot of artists, I'm, you're just going to need to die, and then I'll have it in my collection. So that's that's usually the easiest way. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but really. Um, uh, I think there was one question. Um, a proposal may not take place for two to three years, what if some of the pieces have been sold? Absolutely, totally understand that. One, if you can borrow them back for the exhibition, that's great. Um, or we can, you know, figure out what we need to do. I mean, if, if we're, you know, usually I check in about a year out and then six months out of the exhibition and say, okay, where are we at? And do you have a draft works list proposed? And if you go, oh no, I'm not gonna have enough work, then we, we've got to kind of go back to the drawing board or what are you working on now? Is this similar enough? Can we, you know, or I take it back to the committee. Um, our main galleries, the linear feed for our main museum space is, um, for us, it's about 150 linear feet for the, our main gallery, but we have other galleries, they range from 40 to 60 linear feet. And it really depends. Um, our specs, I don't, they might be on our proposal form. I don't have a, an online form. I just have like a downloadable um, PDF. Um, but again, that's kind of up to the curator. I would say, you know, don't worry about the space. That's not your job. Your job is to bring me work and I'm going to make it look good in the space. I'm going to make sure that it's, you know, that's another thing. Don't assume that the curators don't know how to light your work. I mean, they probably do, especially if they've been doing it a while. So it's one thing to say, hey, this is how I like to have it presented. Could you hang these next to each other? Or this one I think does need a kind of a lot of light, but don't, don't bark orders at the curator of how to show your work because that doesn't always go over so well. And um, don't bring work that wasn't agreed upon. Don't ship work that wasn't properly packed, things like that, that, you know, we remember that. And then we tell our friends um, and say, don't exhibit that person because they weren't easy to work with or they didn't bring it properly or it wasn't, you know, things like that. So that's really negative, I'm sorry, but it does happen and it's frustrating from our end because I, I, I've got so many other things going on. It's a small, you know, um, museum with a small staff that I always have to kind of have, um, you, gotta, you gotta bring it to me ready to go. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Angie. Really um, wonderful information. Well, it looks like we have a few questions and comments. Um, uh, one question, I don't know which one of you would like to answer this that I have, is um, what should you do if there are no instructions on a gallery's website? And I've encountered that often. You know, there's nothing that says, um, you know, artist inquiries, you know, it's almost like clearly like they're saying, don't call us, you know, we'll, we'll call you. Um, what, what can an artist do when, when you yeah. encounter that? I would like to answer that. My website sure. does not have anything but a contact us form. Okay. I want to hear from everybody because you may not even know um, how powerful your work is that you're producing. And I don't want to dissuade anybody from too many rules and regulations because I don't have any rules and regulations. I have a 4,000 square foot space that I could play with. Uh, I could turn it into a 10 by 10 booth for you and, and show very intimate little space. And if you have a mural project on quilts uh, embroidered, I could do that. Um, so in my case, I don't have any limitations. I can hang from the wall and everything, but I would prefer to speak to you um, personally. So asking for an appointment, I like to meet face to face. Um, I don't like texting back and forth. I prefer emails, if anything, and I prefer sending in the mail um, your information. Um, 
if you make it, put everything in the package, it's so much easier for me. Send me a binder. Uh, and if you want the binder back, uh, self-addressed stamped envelope uh, for the return postage. How I said, I'm really old school. And, and I, mm -hmm. I have a lot of stuff, uh, but that's how I, I, how, I just don't trust digital too much because people go out of their way enhancing stuff. Um, in, in, the, in the context of color correction. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And there's nothing wrong with old school. I'm with you on that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rolando. Um, so we have a comment here. Um, I appreciate Rolando's take on work speaking for itself without reference to gender. So um, I think that's, that's a good concept. Um, Another um, comment, um, Rolando, I think the way you operate the gallery is the best. The gallery looks fabulous. Thank you for sticking to your old school. Um, so, okay. Um, and um, a question here um, for you, Rolando, how can an emerging artist balance a robust CV of shows, awards, art fairs, social, et cetera, with the risk of appearing overexposed to a gallery? If you have a, a style, you could also work within the context of series within that style um, and make sure that there's, there's work from a series that you will be presenting in one area and another series in another area to at least give the, the gallery the opportunity to be showing something that's exclusively of that gallery or of that space um, that people will come. And then the other work may, may be perceived as, as advertisement of your technique, of your style, of your, your abilities. Um, and then my job is to have them come to see new work or a series of works that haven't been so overexposed. Um, if you had a great show in New York, and you want to bring the work down here, I'm more than happy to show it here if it got a good reception over there. But if you've shown the same work in San Francisco, in Dallas, in New York, and you still have all 10 pieces, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's gonna be a challenge for me. Um, I like it when you tell me, I started off with 30 pieces and I have 20 that I would still like to show uh, because that means that, that that the market enjoys your work um, and that you do have a following that you do have uh, somewhat. And that's not always the case because if you don't have those shows and I think that your work is worth collecting, I, I, and I could sell my, my collectors um, on, on creating an investment in you um, that's another thing. Uh, and then price points are very important to collectors. Um, if you're producing 300 pieces at a hundred dollars, everybody in the neighborhood is going to have what they have. And they really want to walk around with their stubs and wooden shoes, not, not Kinney brand shoes. Okay. Does that Thank answer you. your question a little bit, Mark? I don't know if he's he's there. Okay, um, so this is from Claire Radigan to everyone. For paintings on canvas, how should the profile be treated? Should they be left white? Should the painting wrap around the sides of the stretcher, painted a neutral color, or or have authentic drips, etc., that are a result of what went on the canvas? Um, so. I'm sorry, I guess it's a question for Rolando. Just saw uh, that. Okay, if, um, if you like to leave the history of your work on your canvas, is it consistent in all of your work? If you're going to finish your edges, uh, is it consistent? If you're going to frame your work, is it consistent? 
if you didn't know yourself and you were presented with the work, would you invest in it? Does it look finished? Um, it's kind of like that scratch and sniff test. Uh, kind of looks like porn, not porn. Maybe it's a nude. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. Um, just be honest with yourself. Are you not finishing your edges because um, you don't want to or because you get bored by the time you finish the painting and um, you don't want to clean up your edges? Uh, do you think about your edges when you're working with the whole canvas? Um, it, it, it's a it's really a personal thing. I have shown all of them, um, but it needs to be somewhat consistent because uh, if not, you you don't look as professional as I want to to be able to present you as. Does that answer? Whoever asked that question? Claire. Yeah, it, it does. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. It does. It's just when I went to to undergraduate and graduate school, I guess there was a, an attitude left over from the abstract expressionists that the sides of the canvas aren't part of the artwork, really. I mean, they're, the artwork is two dimensional and, you know, uh, a lot of the abstract expressionists, you know, painted um, you know, the drips ended up on the side and that kind of seemed to give it off as authenticity. Uh, I, I think it, to me, it seems to come down to ratios. Like I saw a woman's work yesterday that was, they were landscapes and they were tiny and the profiles that the person took great time to finish that painting around the sides of the profiles and it it just weighed the image down. It just looked, I was like, that should have just been left white. It just, mm -hmm. it just looks burdensome and contrived to me when the painting continues around the sides. That's my, my thing. But then, you know, you go to a gallery and sometimes the walls are a neutral color, you know, and if your paintings are white around the side, they, they sometimes look funny. They don't kind of, views with the gallery. So I don't know, I didn't, you know, if anybody else has an opinion about that, I'd be interested as well. Thank you, Claire. Um, here's, there's a question here for Angie, and then I'd like to get, there's one that's come in from Margaret that I think would be interesting. Um, Angie, a proposal that may not take place for two to three years. What if some of the pieces proposed have been sold during the waiting period? Um, well, like I had mentioned before, um, that we I totally expect that to happen. Um, it's awesome if you can borrow the pieces back for the exhibition. Sometimes collectors always feel very special when their work is on display at a museum. And of course, things are going to be, you know, uh, make sure there are proper insurance and everything um, in place. But, you know, sometimes you sold a lot of the work and then we just have to kind of reassess. So you got to check in with the curator and, and let them know as soon as you can, you know, again, I'm going to check in with you and we'll see, okay, where are we at? What does the draft works list look like um, six months, a year out? And, you know, you'll know pretty soon if, do we need to change to a different um, series? Do we need to pull the show? I mean, if, if there's not enough work left, there's not enough work. And if I, if there isn't something else that I think will work in the space, then, you know, yeah. <laughs> okay. So sell your work if right. you can. Always sell your work. That is, you know, get it out the door because you can make more, but, right. you know, um, it, it'll be all right. <laughs> Good. So um, this last question, they'd like to hear from each of you. We'll start with Amanda. Um, so what do each of you think about artists putting their art on commercial merchandise? Amanda, would you like to tackle that first? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I would want to know why you would, you would want to do that. Um, if it's related to, I mean, for me personally, um, we're a nonprofit community art center, so I'm not represent, I'm not like Rolando representing an artist for the long haul. Usually it's for a show and, um, that's probably about it until they have their next show years down the road, whatever. Um, 
Uh, I wish I wasn't the first one answering that. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, oh, okay. part of me just wants to say, hey, if, if that's what you want to do, go right ahead. Um, it doesn't it doesn't affect me and my position where I work um, per se, but I just, you know, as an artist in general, I would just say be careful about doing that to your work, having it out there like that. And what's the quality like? I, I mean, are you Van Gogh? You're going to have your starry night on a mug. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would be wary of that. I think it uh, just depends on your goals as an artist. I mean, I know some artists who are overexposed and have a lower price point, but that's because their goal is to get their work in every single household. Yeah. And it's consistent and they can make prints and they can put their work on mugs. And the goal is qu quantity necessarily um, over, I'm not necessarily saying quality, but, um, you know, the goal, <laughs> but the goal isn't necessarily museum shows or to be um, in the, I think it just kind of depends. Um, you're probably not going to be collected by museums later on and that's okay. I mean, you know, but I would be very careful about making sure lawyers look at those contracts because you don't want your work to be stolen. You don't want your work to be misused. I mean, I know some artists who print their, their images on clothing and then want to sell it in our museum shop. And I'm like, but yeah, I'm kind of like Amanda, like why? I mean, yeah, it's your goals, I guess. I'm yeah, going to be the, I'm going to be the voice of dissension. <laughs> <laughs> I agree to uh, with Angie. It depends on what goals uh, you have. I have one particular piece, which is on my arm. Let me see if I could show you. Oh, there we go. Uh, there you go. It's my logo. It's my bird. And it's bird in Spanish called pájaro. And I came up with that image uh, during the AIDS pandemic, when all my friends were dying, we had all been invited to move because we were young, we were gay, and it was not acceptable in our homes. So we were asked to leave. Subsequently, the AIDS pandemic came and most of us died because not in my house. So that image, whoa, let me see, is on lighters, is on scarves, is on sneakers. It's every place because it is my longest lasting intervention piece. And it's a life effort. That one image that was used as epitaphs uh, originally to get it back in everyone's home. And that is its purpose. Uh, as a tongue-in-cheek kind of F you to homophobia and homophobics. Uh, so that particular image of my work is um, overexposed. It's gotten me a lot of accolades, got me a lot of fame for it. The other works that I do, uh, I did toe tags, uh, school supplies for the next generation, uh, which were toe tags uh, that had a, a symbol that says school supplies and referencing the, the disregard for gun reform, uh, not one way or the other, but asking people to just fill out the toe tags and choose the right size body bag. Uh, so there was toe tags and body bags. And I leave bunches of them in, in, in places uh, as an intervention piece to raise awareness of what school supplies will look like in the future if we can continue along the path that we're going on. So if the work warrants over, you know, it, if it's part of the work, I would say by all means, uh, do multiples and saturate the market if that is its purpose. Um, it, some people do slaps, which are stickers, and that is their artwork. Um, so it's six of this and half a dozen of the other. If you're a, a painter, which I have my paintings also, I do not, I very seldomly um, uh, do prints of my paintings. Uh, if anything, I will do a series, a limited series of three, uh, very large prints uh, because they can't, you know, basically so that it's exhibited somewhere else. Uh, because the painting can't be transferred so so often. 
Um, so it's a compromise, uh, but it's up to you. Um, if you know what the purpose is, um, if not, basically you're a commercial artist, not a, not a fine artist. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Well, I guess um, we are um, okay or over our uh, one hour time limit by just a few minutes. But clearly this is subject matter that we could talk about for a couple of hours. So I would um, really like to thank Amanda, Angie, and Rolando. Um, this is been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And, uh, and we were just uh, so glad that you participated. Um, so thank you, Pam, for hosting and um, for Nancy's help as well, putting this together. And I guess if you'd like to contact any of our presenters, and this is has been recorded, so you will have access to it as well. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. On behalf of the Florida Artist Group, I want to thank you for joining us for How to Hear Yes to Gallery Representation. We hope you've enjoyed this live presentation. And a link to the video recording of this presentation will be sent to you in the next few days. At the end of this session, a short survey will be sent to you, and I hope you will reply. Some of the programs still have openings, so review our roster of events and register by visiting www.floridaartistsgroup.org. Thank you. Bye.